My guest today, get this, lost 160 pounds. I'll say that again. 160, 160 pounds. He is a true health success. And now I am honored to call him not just a guest here on the exam room podcast, but a fellow weight loss champion. Anthony Masiello is here with us on the show today. My friend, it is great to have you here and congratulations from one weight loss success to another. Thank you, Chuck. Yeah, it's, it's a real pleasure to be here. I'm excited to talk to the weight loss champion. <laughs> and, to, and to be called a fellow champion. That's incredible. Thank you. Uh, well, anybody that's lost that amount of weight, I think really deserves accolades because as you know, very well, it is not the easiest thing in the world to do. Um, let's start with the big question right out of the gate is how did you get up to the point where you had 160 pounds that you needed to lose? Yeah, for, for me, it happened really slowly. Um, it started back in probably fourth or fifth grade. I gained weight over the summer. I, I went back and forth. I spent my school years in North Carolina with my mom. I spent my summers in New Jersey with my dad. And I think that three month break was enough when I came back to school the, after a summer break, um, I had gained weight. And my friends asked me, they said, Anthony, what happened? How'd you get so fat over the summer? And I don't know how big I was at that point, but um, it wasn't anything that I don't think anyone would have described as obese, but it was in the 80s and most people were pretty slim, especially in the fourth and fifth grades. And it was enough to be noticed. And it and it kind of became, you know, I kind of became identified as one of the fat kids. There was two of us in our class. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I was one of two as well. Um, it's funny, though, that you say like that little break, people were able to tell a difference um, in terms of your weight, I remember something, a much shorter time frame, um, going on vacation with my father and stepmother for two weeks during the summer. And when I came back, mom was like, what in the world happened to you? You put on so much weight over the course of just two weeks. And so it amazes me how quickly a person is able to pack on those excess pounds if they're eating the, and I'm going to put this one in quotes, the right kind of foods, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think it just is, a, is that short break is enough for somebody to remember, you know, kind of how you were at this point and then see you how you are today. Whereas if I wouldn't have left, I don't know if my classmates would have noticed anything if I would have continued seeing them, you know, over those months and the same maybe with you, if you hadn't been away for that week or two. Um, yeah. Who, who knows? Yeah. Um, all I know is like binges of fried oysters probably did me in that go around. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, steaks that were entirely too big for my third grade self at that point. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, I, I sympathize with you. I was over a hundred pounds by the time um, I was, I was that age and it was, it was just mortifying. Right. Yeah. I mean, like that's like twice the size of anybody else in class. Um, and, and that wasn't the easiest thing to handle. Um, yes. What, Logically, what, it's tough. And, and that really carried with me, you yeah. know, so, so going through high school and, um, and becoming an adult, you know, if, if that's how I thought of myself and, it's it's how and it prevented me from doing some things, you know, like I, I wouldn't necessarily always be the first to volunteer to put myself in front of the classroom or the first to ask, you know, a girl, if, you know, out on a date or something like that, because I always had that barrier. But um, also, I probably was the first to get invited whenever someone wanted to go wanted an excuse for them to go have ice cream or pizza. You find that people who want to um do something a little decadent they'll 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 invite you because they think you'll say yes they'll go with you and i think it helped to basically just kind of continue the cycle of continuing to eat more and continuing to you know engage in those unhealthy habits and gradually grow up to the point that where by the time i was married i was well by the time i graduated high school i was about 300 pounds and then by the time i got married i was you know 350 plus pushing close to 360 pounds. Mm. What was your diet looking like at that time? You mentioned pizza and ice cream, but I mean, I remember getting all the way up to 10,000 calories. Walk us through what your daily diet was at your worst. Yeah. So at my worst, it's funny because um, in the early nineties, I went vegetarian. And I did that as an attempt to lose weight and, and get healthy, what I, what I thought I need to do to get healthy. And when I first switched, it worked pretty well. 
because all I did was I bought a wok and I would stir fry vegetables and I would steam rice and I would eat vegetables and rice. And then I learned that cheese pizza, you know, was still vegetarian. <laughs> and then cheese stuffed pizza was still vegetarian. And then cheese stuffed pizza with that garlic sauce they give you on the side of the Papa John's pizza is, is still vegetarian. And Ben and Jerry's ice cream is vegetarian. And we would get that, uh, that the flavor chubby hubby was my favorite. And I would tell my wife she didn't need any because she already had her chubby hubby. So I could eat the whole entire pint. <laughs> you know, it's like... It basically, um, I was eating unhealthy food, but I, I don't believe I was necessarily, um, I wasn't only on junk food by the time, you know, so, so in the early nineties, I lost some weight, um, uh, becoming vegetarian. Then it all came back over time. But, um, I was also from the year 2000, I've been a member of CSA farms, which is CSA is community supported agriculture. And that's where basically you buy a share of a farm and every week you go pick up what's right, what's right, um, your portion of the of the vegetables for that week. And I was committed to always eating all those vegetables. And but I guess the pizza, the garlic sauce, the French fries and then, um, you know, maybe the desserts was enough to to keep me up at that 360 pounds. But I didn't really have days where I was eating fast food three and four times a day, you know, um, and, and that was kind of puzzling to me. And in some ways, it kind of made me justify my size. And I used to say, well, maybe I'm just a giant. Maybe this is just how I am. And it, and it kind of made me feel a little bit helpless because I was eating, you know, uh, plenty of kind of homemade food. And, and it seemed like any fast food and stuff like that was just kind of sprinkled in. What, when you would indulge in the fast food and the pizza and the ice cream, what was the portion size for you? Was it a little bit larger than normal, really, really large? Or did you think like you were about normal? Yeah, no, I knew I would like if we stay with the pizza example, you know, I probably had two more slices than anyone else when we would get a pizza. So maybe that usually meant I would have four slices and the average person that, that would have two slices or Maybe if there was a big bowl of chips out and without having it portioned, maybe I would eat disproportionately double the chips that anyone else would eat at that, you know, at that, at that gathering or that get together, um, stuff like that. But, but not that I really, not that I really noticed. I wasn't ordering two pizzas and eating them all for myself. I will say those, those pints of Ben and Jerry's, I mean, that would become, that would be a one serving thing for me. Because uh, I was traveling for work quite a bit and the hotel was next to the hotel I would go to in Boston was next to a grocery store. And I could just, you know, after the day was over after work and dinner, if we had a dinner meeting or whatever, I could easily go there and just grab some dessert and I could just get a pint of ice cream. In the, and of course, I had no freezer. So I had all the excuses in the world, all the reasons in the world to eat the whole pint myself. So I, I think it was those kinds of things. And I do think I find comfort in eating and I find you know, when I get excited, I eat. When I, when I get depressed, I eat. When I get happy, sad, you know, everything is a, an excuse to eat something. Yeah, well, let's just jump ahead. Do you, do you still kind of have a little bit of that mindset left over, even though you've progressed into this newer, healthier form? Yeah, I'm more mindful of it now. Mm -hmm. So I'm more aware of it. And I notice it. And I'm like, huh, there it is, you know, and or or. It just happens that I don't notice it, but it doesn't matter because I've got my list of foods that I do eat is set up in a way where the, they don't bother me. So maybe now I'll overeat carrot sticks or I'll have a couple of extra pieces of fresh fruit. Maybe I'll have two apples instead of one apple where everyone else would have one apple. I would have two. So it's it's that kind of stuff now where it doesn't necessarily show up on me. But I definitely still have those kind of feelings and those in those pulls. I'm very susceptible to food cravings and, and things like that. You're not alone. I remember early in my plant based journey remarking to my wife, she's like, why are you so confident that this will work? And I my answer was that because even if I get back to the portion sizes that I once was eating, the mere fact that I'm eating a whole food plant based diet really kind of makes it impossible 
to get back up to 420 pounds. It's just, there's just not going to be enough calories there. And your stomach is just not ever going to be big enough to accommodate the quantity of food that you would need to eat in order to get up to, for me, 10,000 calories a day. It sounds to me like you are sharing that similar type of mindset. Yeah. Yeah. I would, I agree with that. I agree with that fully. And that's why when people say, do you worry about gaining back the weight? Like I don't really worry. I mean, the thing that would cause me to gain back the weight is if I dramatically change my eating pat or my eating, my, what, what makes up my diet, basically what's included on my diet. And fortunate for me now, having lost the weight and having kept it off for, um, for so long, it's, I'm really not worried about that. All my habits and all my, you know, every, everything I go for is within my kind of set plan. I want to go back also, again, I want to circle back. I, I can't let the pizza and ice cream go just yet. Um, when you discovered that that was still vegetarian, did you in your mind kind of convince yourself that because it's vegetarian, it must have been healthy? No, um, okay. I, just, I, I didn't believe it was healthy, but it was never enough to pull me back to eating meat because I knew that I felt even though I had gained, I gotten up to my heaviest weight as a vegetarian, I knew that the way I felt when I was eating sausage and hamburgers and, you know, and things like that, I didn't feel as good. So I wanted to stay vegetarian and then actually made trick, made it tricky when I was ready to get, get serious and, and lose weight again, because it was hard to find a vegetarian weight loss plan or a vegetarian diet plan that I would want, that I would want to start. Mm. What kind of health challenges were you facing there when you stepped on the scale? You said, oh, my God, I got 160 pounds to lose here. Did you have hypertension? Did you have diabetes, pre-diabetes? How would you say your health was overall at that point? Well, the biggest indicator at all for me was in October of 2005, I applied for a life insurance policy because my wife was pregnant with our second son and it came back denied. So this was a 20 year term life insurance policy. I was 30 years, I was 33 years old. And basically this insurance company told me they didn't expect me to hit 53. And that alone was a shock and that was really hard to take. But what it mostly forced me to do is take a real honest and objective look at how my health was. And the truth is it wasn't pretty you know, uh, overweight, 360 pounds, 54 inch waist. Um, I was on medication for high blood pressure. I, my cholesterol was high, but it was, it was, you know, it was well, it was well over 200, but it wasn't to the point where my doctor was forcing me to go on medication. So what it said in my chart was declined medication. Um, I had sleep apnea that again, I went to the sleep study and they said, you have sleep apnea. They tried to give me the CPAP machine. I didn't want that either. And then um, I had migraine headaches, the kind that would send me home from work probably at least three times a month. I would just have to come home and lay in a dark room because there's nothing I could do to get rid of them. I had an eczema on my fingers that had been there from elementary school. And I had developed psoriasis behind my neck here um, on both sides that would, that would kind of flare up and down. And um, I guess those combinations of things, you know, when the when you know, this insurance company put all their information into the into the system, it popped out and said, bad bet. He's not going to make it 20 years, not going to make it to 53. And that was really scary as could be. That is a, a bit of a, a wake up a bit. I mean, that's a, that's a heck of a wake up call. Did you come home and have any conversations with your wife at that point? Like, I can't believe I was just told that. Like, that's it's got you had to have, had, you know, wanted to talk to somebody about that. Yeah, well. It was scary. And I, and I did talk to my wife and there's two ways I could have taken it. And I think there's two ways anyone could have taken it. I could have um, basically said this insurance company has no idea what they're talking about and that I'm fine. And, you know, there were some minor technicalities in my medical chart that prevented me from getting this life insurance policy and that we should fight it or reapply or something like that. And if I would have been in a bold move or, or maybe a confident position at the time I read that letter, I might have very easily taken that, that position. And I honestly think it would have done nothing for me. I mm -hmm. think I could have probably gotten an insurance policy from another provider and just kind of went, went along my, you know, with life. 
But fortunately enough for me, it forced, you know, whatever reason, the mood I was in when I read that was to look internally. And I did, I spoke with my wife and I told her and I said, look, I just have to do something about this. And I said, what can, what can I do to change this outcome? Not what can, what can someone else do? And um, there were so many things in life that just weren't the way I wanted them to be. Um, there's, there's one, one story that really kind of jumps out at me that um, it was like my real catalyst for, for change. Um, you know, my wife was pregnant with our second son around this time that I was applying for the insurance and the local fair was in town. So we had an 18 month baby at home and at 18 months, you know, kids are just, they're, they're just kind of getting to the point where they can play. They can say a couple words. They can, you know, they can, you can make them laugh by talking to them. You know, they're, they're like becoming young humans. And we took Evan to the fair for the first time. And I'm walking around with him on my chest like this, and we're just getting there and there's lights everywhere and there's music. I mean, you could imagine what it's like for a kid to see a, a carnival or a fair for the first time. And he's just as excited as could be and looking at everything. And we, we come around the corner and he sees a train ride. You know, it's, it's a tiny train. It's, with this whole thing was just set up in a church parking lot. But he got so excited. He started wiggling in my arms and he was pointing at it. And he was like probably saying train, train. Like he, he, we're like, wow. I'm like, Kathy, look at this. Like he, he's excited about the train. So we, we walk over to take him on the on the train ride. And as we get close, just as naturally as could be, I hug my I you know, kind of hook my thumbs under his armpits and I go to pull him off my shirt, hand him to my wife because I'm not going to go on the train. You know, I couldn't fit on the adult rides at the, at the fair. There's no way I'm going to fit on this kitty ride. Right. And he can't go by himself. So as I hook my thumbs under him and go to pull him away, like he's not letting go of my shirt, you know, he's like pulling. And I felt like he wanted me to take him on the ride. Right. But, but it was impossible. So luckily I'm bigger than him. <laughs> so I pull him off my chest and I hand him to my wife and and she gets in line and, and, you know, they give the tickets. We all go up and get tickets. And I'm just kind of there in awe. Like, we're just so excited that he wants to go on this train and that he's going to get to go on this train. So I'm watching there as they go and they walk to the train and they get on their seats. And I must have been just standing there kind of like a, you know, a little doofus or something like because the guy kind of snapped me out of it, the attendant. And he said, excuse me, sir, you have to stand over here because I guess I was blocking. So no one else could get on the on the ride or something. And when I stood over on the side and then I had to just watch as they went around in circles and they were having fun. They were laughing. You know, they weren't thinking about me. Um, and in the meantime, I'm standing here outside of a metal gate and I'm watching and I'm not able to participate. And, uh, and two questions popped into my mind. And the first one was, is this the kind of father that I'm going to be? And the second question it was, is this the kind of husband that I'm going to be for the rest of my life? The one that can't help or the one that can't do things or the one who's not going to be able to participate in the kids' lives. And you know, that's, that's really all I needed. Those two questions just absolutely haunted me. And I don't think I ever talked to my wife about those two questions or I didn't really talk to anyone about them, but I just kept them inside me. And I just used them as, um, you know, the answer had to be no. And I was the only one that could change that. And if I kept going the way I was, the answer to those questions was absolutely going to be yes. Anthony, I can see the emotion on your face thinking back to that day and that conversation you were having with yourself. And we're talking about that was many years ago now. You didn't want to have that conversation with your wife, especially not right then and there. They're coming off of this high from riding the train. How did you hide your emotions for the rest of that day? Yeah, you know, it, it, the questions came in and it just kind of set me a little bit into a daze. But, you know, eventually I snapped out of it, probably when the train stopped and, and, and my kid gets to, you know, kind of run towards me or something like that, you know, afterwards or when I, when I scoop them up. But, um, yeah, I didn't talk to my wife about it. And, and you know, I don't know. I, I would guess you have a similar, a similar uh, experience, Chuck, but we get used to just kind of burying things. Um, when, you know, I had been depressed before 
I'm, I'm not saying clinically depressed or diagnosed as being depressed, but I have had depressing moments in the, in the past, things that kind of made me feel down. And I just learned to kind of shove them aside. And I think that's what I did in that moment. But, um, but I, in every time I reflect back and think about that, it makes me want to be a better person mm. and not just for me, but for, you know, for my wife and for my kids. Had you not had that experience that day, do you think you would be in the position you are today? Do you think that you would have been able to make that change? Yeah, I don't know. It was powerful. It was powerful. And, um, you know, it's really hard to say. I had, you know, so much of it just becomes on how we look at these situations and the stories that we tell ourselves. And I've been very fortunate, or I think I've gotten lucky, and I call it an alignment of the stars or the perfect storm this time that allowed me to lose weight this time that prevented me from losing weight and keeping it off for the probably hundreds of times that I, uh, that I had attempted before, is that this time there were enough of these dots lined up that it, that it all worked. And, and that was one of the dots, but I think something else could have replaced that dot as well. You know, I traveled for work and I would have to ask for the seatbelt extension. I'm sitting next to a colleague that we're supposed to have mutual respect for each other. And I have to, you know, I have to be this guy who asked for a seatbelt extension so I could buckle up on the plane. You know, there, there are a lot of little things and, and we can choose to blow them off or dismiss them, or we can choose to let them empower us and let us fuel change and, and going forward. And I'm just very grateful that for whatever reason, those, those series of events in 2005, going into early 2006, I, I use them as fuel and I'm just grateful, forever grateful that whatever reason, um, that's how I did it. Isn't it funny how so many people who have these incredible weight loss stories, uh, part of their journey inevitably includes having to use a seatbelt extender on an airplane and just the mortifying feeling of asking for one, you know, when I'm you're sure embarrassed. It's embarrassing, right? I'm sure. Yeah. It's the worst. Right? It's the absolute pits, man. It's almost as bad as walking down the aisle when you get on the plane late and every single person with a seat next to them is staring at you every step that you're taking, right? I mean, that's mm -hmm. bad too. And then there's sigh of relief when you go past them, you know? Mm -hmm. It's, you know. Oh, and, yeah, man. Yeah. And, and they're hard and, you know, they're easy to joke about moments and stuff. But, you know, I can always really speak for myself, but they weigh over time. Oh, absolutely. It, it adds up. And, um, you know, no matter how dismissive we try to be of those things, it, it, it hurts and it can either hurt and it can lead to, you know, us feeling sorry for ourselves or something like that, or we can mm -hmm. let it hurt and we can use that to turn things around. And, um, you know, I think we have a little more control over what we do with it than we give ourselves credit for. And that's one thing I would wish for other people to just, you know, use that fuel and, and, and turn your situation around. I like the way that your mind works, you know, that that's, uh, I, that's that fork in the road that I, I often talk about. It's like, you, you have a choice, you know, you can go left and kind of keep going in that same direction that you've been going, or you can take a right, you know, and go right back, um, on a, on a healthier track. So, um, yeah, I, I think that mindset is, is very, very, very important. Also too, is the recognition that, you know, you got a little bit more going on, um, than just saying, well, I eat the wrong foods at, at, at certain times. I mean, um, for me, I, I was a full blown food junkie, right? I mean, like yeah. fast food was my life. Do you feel like you were hooked on food at all? You know, now I'm more, I'm more aware. And I see like, if I, if I have a salty lunch, then I want a snack later in the day. And I'm like, isn't that weird? But if I eat lunch out, even if it's somewhere healthy, um, I, I want a snack. So I recognize that all of those things add up. But um, I definitely put food at the at the center of things. You know, I would get to work in the morning and the first thing I would be thinking about is where are we going to go for lunch today? You know, who wants mm -hmm. to go for lunch? Where are we going to go? Um, you know, those kinds of things. But, but it wasn't necessarily um, fast food that I was looking for. I was looking for you know, any kind of satiating food. It was probably rich food, but not necessarily um, a fast food. And I think being a vegetarian kind of nudged me away from that because most of the fast food places are either like, you know, fried chicken places or burger places or, you know, around here there's hot dogs and, and stuff like that. 
All right. So you mentioned that you went on like a hundred different kinds of diets uh, before you stumbled across uh, whole food plant based here, man. So let's let's talk about some of those diets. The biggies for me were the cookie diet. Uh, I did a low carb, no carb thing. Uh, I did a, uh, a, a just like a shake diet. So like meal replacement plan. Um, I did one of those and every variation out there, um, you know, dozens of times over. What were some of the more colorful diets yeah. that you tried i mean i i i basically just bounced back and forth between well probably there's three options number one was just to convince myself i shouldn't be eating anything and basically just try to starve myself for a period of time those mm -hmm. never lasted too long you know i would try to eat like you know a, a small salad for for a meal and then um you know whatever you know for for a, a snack or a small dinner and then just try to let myself be hungry all the time. So that didn't really work. And then I, um, I tried no, no sugar, no carbs for a while when I was, when I was younger and that, um, yeah, I didn't really have any, any details <laughs> on that one. Cause I don't think I really knew what I was doing when I was trying that one. But, um, I remember not eating, I was in the South, so I remember not eating biscuits or not eating breads, but um, just eating everything else and not really changing much else. So, so I didn't get any results from, from doing that. I probably didn't do that one very well. I didn't really follow it like what you were saying to, to the book. Then the one that I had mixed success with was I tried just giving up fat and I would buy no fat versions of everything I could get my hand on and my hands on. And, and I wasn't good at that either because I would still then get my biscuit. But instead of getting butter on my biscuit, I would get jelly on my biscuit, not realizing that biscuits are cooked with tons of butter anyway. There's already tons of butter and fat inside the biscuit. So um, I think I just didn't get I never really got super serious or super methodical. I just basically would try to keep myself hungry and change what I was eating until I went vegetarian and that one, like I said, that worked because I would just eat vegetable. I didn't have any, you know, this was back in 1994, January 1994. And that one worked in that I probably got down to about 270 or 275 pounds for a little while because I was just basically cooking my own vegetables and eating vegetables and rice. Mm. And I was still cooking with oil in the wok and, and stuff like that. But, but that worked for me, but I didn't really have enough parameters around it because like i said before i let the cheese and everything else and cheese and breads and stuff kind of sneak back in you know it's uh, you and the walk that you know reminds me of uh i remember my mom going out and getting an electric walk uh yeah. when i was like 10 something so that would have been like the early 90s i guess maybe was that the rage back then no, what, what, it was. mine wasn't even electric mine went on top of the gas stove but you could like they had a, com a tv commercial for a walk in between everything that was going on <laughs> And half the time they had the 800 number at the bottom of the screen. You just had to call it up I and know. give them a credit card. And then they would, the walk would be at your house. I'm positive that's where I got it because it was an authentic hand hammered walk. You know, I can almost I can almost hear these commercials, the hand hammered walk. Um, and it, no, it, 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 in the 90s, that's what we did. We had a we had a walk. Man, I, I think, do you still have one? Because I think that, yeah. you know, eating a much healthier diet, man, a walk, you could dominate some meals in there and do a daggone fine, healthy meal. Yeah, it was fun. The thing I, the only way I knew how to do it was I would get peanut oil because it said you had to have a really high heat oil. And I believe it was peanut oil and then put that in the walk. So that's something I wouldn't do today. Mm -hmm. And then I would just get all these bottles of these Asian sauces. They had like maybe 10 of them or so at the, in the grocery store. And I would put some vegetables in there and then I would, you know, cook them in the oil and then I would pour the sauce in there and then I would add the rice, stir it all together and put it in a bowl. And, um, <laughs> you know, it was good enough at the time. It was much better than what I had been doing. But I think if I ate that today, I would probably maybe I would go back up to 275 pounds or something <laughs> like, you know, I probably wouldn't make it back to 360, but but it's it was pretty rich. Yeah, man. You know, it's funny. Um, my wife and I got Thai carry out uh, over this past weekend. And I was like, all right, well, look, here's the deal. I'm vegan. I eat really healthy. Um, what can you do for me? He's like, well, look, no problem. We've got a bunch of vegan options. And I settled on this curry. Now, I was expecting there to be some fat in there, probably like with some coconut milk or something yeah. like that. What I was not expecting 
was to get this container, get it home. You know, silly me, rookie mistake. Didn't open it and, and examine it while I was there. The tofu that they had put in there, one, was fried. Oh. Two, they must have dumped a half a gallon of oil in there, too, because it was like the liquid and the oil had separated in yeah. the container. And it was one of those see-through plastic containers. So you could actually see the oil sitting on top, man. It was like a sheen. It was like the Exxon Valdez was in my dinner. Um, and and so I quickly punted and made something here because I just I'm not going to eat something like that, even if I had paid fifteen ninety five for it. It's you know the cost is not worth the cost of my health at that point. Plus, I don't even think it would taste very good. Like, can you imagine Anthony now eating something that is so slick? That's the only way I can put it slick with oil. Um, you know, you might not quite know what to do with it. Your mouth be might be like, what is going on right now? Yeah, I, I agree. It, or it might just coat everything and you wouldn't be able to taste anything. I mean, I don't know how, I don't know how that would go. I, I mean, I, I don't know. Yeah, I took one look at it. I was just like, no way. I should really put that up on the Instagram too. Cause I got a, I got a heck of a video of that. I mean, I'm not kidding you. When I say it was, it was like a quarter you should, inch. You should thick share it. And, and, layer, it, man. and it's hard. It just shows how stacked up the world is against us. And that's why it's probably why we were the way we are also. You know, if that's normal and, and, and you gave them all your requests, you wanted it to be vegan, you want it to be as healthy as possible. And that's what you got. Yep. Yep. And I, I even got, yes. yeah, like I, I was confident with this particular restaurant because when I said, um, you know, I'm vegan, what can you do for me? And I inquired specifically about this curry. The guy went to the back and he came back and he used the exact term. No problem. There are no animal products in this. Okay. So when somebody uses the term animal products to me, right. I'm assuming they know what, right. you know, I'm looking for, right. That's kind of an insider, healthy vegan term. In right. my opinion, I guess my opinion was definitely wrong on this night, but, but that did give me a layer of confidence. And I don't, I don't know, man, they had tempura listed on the menu and other places. And so I would assume that, you know, if I said, well, throw some tofu in that, they would have said, well, this is tofu that's been fried. It, it was just right. listed as tofu, not tempura. So I'm like, yeah. you guys, <laughs> you're killing me here. Literally, you're killing me here. Exactly. Um, they don't even know. I know, man. So when did the whole idea of, uh, Really adopting this clean plant-based diet uh, pop onto your radar. When did all of this start yes, creeping so, into so your life? I, I, you know, by the end of 2005, I set a New Year's resolution to lose 50 pounds um, in the year 2006. And all I was going to do to start was not have any soda and not have any sweets. So all desserts were off the table and all soda was off the table. I did that for January, February, and March, and I kind of kept myself hungry because, you know, I just knew that I shouldn't be eating so much, and I didn't lose any weight. And, um, you know, that was kind of a bummer, too. I stuck with no sweets and no soda, but I, but I still wasn't and, and eating less, right? And so I just started searching the internet for vegetarian weight loss. And I found um, Dr. Furman's book, Eat to Live, that popped up on Amazon. And this, was per this part was perfect for me because on the cover, it, in this banner, it says um, fast and the key to, maybe it says the key or it says, it definitely says fast and sustained weight loss. I was like, oh, that's what I want. But then I read all the comments and the reviews on the book and no one was talking about weight loss. Everyone was talking about how they got healthy, how they did this plan and they got healthy. And that was another kind of epiphany moment for me. And I was like, oh, weight loss is not going to get me that insurance policy. Weight loss is not going to give me the confidence to know that I'm going to be around for my kids. Getting healthy is what I really need to do. And I almost put the weight loss as on, on the back burner. And I said, I need to get healthy. So, of course, I bought the book. Um, and I got it home and I just started doing exactly what it said. Even as I started reading first chapter, you know, I just started making changes instantly. Were you nervous at all? Uh, because for somebody who's not 
familiar with that way of eating yet. I mean, it can seem ultra restrictive at first, even though essentially all you're doing is eliminating two things from your diet. At the end of the day, you're eliminating dairy, you're eliminating meat, right? And and that's the, the idea behind going plant-based. But then you start looking at things like really keeping the fat low, really minimizing added sugar, added sodium. How restricted did you feel? And did that shake your confidence at all? I, did, I didn't really feel restricted. And mostly because I think because I was already vegetarian, I was already eating vegetables. And what I learned, the first thing I learned from that book is that the more vegetables you eat, the healthier you will be. And the, the goal was to push processed food and dairy completely off the table. So I focused on eating more. For example, I never ate breakfast. Or sometimes if I ate breakfast, I would go to Dunkin' Donuts and I would get a large coffee, but it would have cream and sugar in it. So um, I said, okay, well, I'm, you know, obviously no more cream. I had not been having sugar, but um, because that was my New Year's resolution that I was sticking to. But um, I said, okay, well, I don't eat breakfast. Um, now I'm going to start eating fruit for breakfast. So I started adding the healthy stuff and I just let that naturally displace everything else. For lunch, if my friends were going to the to the pizza place, I would still go to the pizza place and I would get a huge entree side salad. And the one salad I would get, it was called the godmother salad. And uh, it had fruit and it had some walnuts in it. It had it sliced apples, sliced pear, um, lots of tomatoes and onions and over a big bowl of lettuce. And then I would get uh, one slice of pizza with no cheese on it. They had like this bruschetta pizza where there's just like, you know, three little pieces of mozzarella and they were very happy to take that off of my slice. So, but I would always eat the salad first and then I would eat the salad and the pizza. And then eventually I would eat the salad and then the pizza, but I wouldn't eat the crust of the, of the pizza. And eventually I'd get to the point where I was just eating the salad and, um, and, you know, but is always focus on eating more of this rather than restricting or, or, or stopping that. And it was just, you know, just a mental game. In the end of the day, I was eating the same as somebody who would approach it the opposite way. Huge, huge, huge. What you just said that that was not a throwaway line. Uh, it, it was. It is completely a mental game, and just letting the healthier food displace the things that you had been eating. Because I think that if you were to tell somebody who's about to change their way of eating that they could never eat this or that again, and those are the things that they've been enjoying their entire life, that's really going to sour them on the idea of proceeding down this healthier path. But if you just naturally let the healthier fare displace those types of foods, they're not necessarily even going to realize so much that those foods that they have been eating, that this and that are no longer there. They've been displaced. So that mindset from my experience and sounds like from yours is absolutely critical. Absolutely. Had somebody told you though, Anthony, that you would no longer be eating that pizza eventually do you think you still would have been so receptive to this new way of eating? I would have probably been good for about a week. <laughs> I'm serious, you know, like as soon as you put something on the do not eat list, it's all you can think about. Right. Oh, never having that again. Like that's scary. Um, um, you know, and I did that with soda and sweets, but uh, I got away with it because it, they weren't very important to me. If you were to try to take away pizza, that's important. That was important to me. I've probably said pizza a thousand times on this podcast so far. Um, yeah. You know, it, it, so, and I still have pizza, but now my pizza has five vegetables. That's my, that's our rule. It has that five vegetables on it and it has to have no cheese. And we just get it from this one place that knows not to saute the vegetables in oil before you put them on the, on the pizza. So we, you know, he literally puts raw spinach and he puts uh, steamed broccoli and, and uh, some mushrooms and onions on there and they cook it. So then my concession there is the white bread, but you know, it doesn't taste um, like, you know, pizza is good when it has cheese on it. Like, it, like that's a trigger for me, but pizza without cheese and loaded up with vegetables, not really a trigger for me. It's, it's a good food, but it's not the kind of thing where I'm going to go and, and eat a whole pizza, you know, Damn, it kind of tastes good enough to, to be fine, but, but I, you know, I'll have my salad with it, you know, for sure. Do, do you still find yourself going back for those uh, extra couple of slices or really, uh, it yeah. doesn't taste that good? <laughs> you know, you, you, I think you know what I mean. Like, yeah, if I was to have the most tempting food or the food that I grew up as a child, you know, like just craving all the time, then I would I would just constantly keep going back. 
and I think it's another concept that I've just learned to to be very comfortable with and realize how much it helps me. Like mm. when we look for plant based replacements for foods that I used to crave, I don't want them to taste as good as the foods I used to crave because I don't want to crave these new versions any more than I want to crave those other versions. Mm -hmm. I want it to be good enough to enjoy, but not not hyper good so that I want to eat it all the time. Or that I want to eat it for fun. For sure, man. Um, so let's see here. We only have a, a couple minutes remaining. I can't believe we've already gone 40 minutes on this interview, man. I, I love going inside the mind of somebody who's been on a similar journey. I mean, I, I swear I could do these all day, every day, it's and fun. it would never get old. Um, so going into this, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, sleep apnea. How quickly did you notice improvement in those areas once you transitioned to that plant-based diet? So the one that I was measuring the most because I was medicated was high blood pressure. And it started dropping immediately. And I was on two different medications and I was on a high dose of the second medication. And I don't remember exactly how we ramped down it, but my doctor made me come in every week and she would make adjustments to my, uh, to my medication. And I was totally off of that within, I think, two or three months. My blood pressure became ideal without medication anymore. And that's mm -hmm. before I lost significant weight. You know, I, the first two months, I think I lost about 30 pounds. Um, that was just kind of the initial, initial shock. And then I don't remember how long it took for the cholesterol and for the sleep apnea and all of those things to disappear. But uh, it took a total of 20 months for me to lose 160 pounds. So less than two years, um, average weight loss, about eight pounds a month. And it was pretty steady on that. And, uh, yeah, I just kind of let it roll and then it stopped. And then, and then it stopped. Were your doctors receptive to what it was that you were doing? I mean, it sounds to me like your doctor must've been kind of plugged in if you were going in there regularly to make sure that your blood pressure medication was being adjusted as you were being weaned off. Yeah, she was incredible. My doctor, Dr. Polt, she was incredibly supportive. Um, she was, you know, just regular family, family medicine doctor here in New Jersey. And I would just go in there and she would, you know, she kept me very responsible. And since I was medicated for high blood pressure, I've learned now that if you let your blood pressure go too low, you know, you can fall over and bang your head or something and get hurt from an injury, but, you know, just from having low blood pressure. So she took that very seriously. And then she would like high five me. She would be excited for me. Oh, let's get on the scale and see how much weight you lost this time. You know, it was almost like a, it, it became, it was terrible to go to the doctor before. And then it became almost fun to go to the doctor. And she told me, she said, you know, you were one of my least healthy patients. And now you're one of my most healthy patients um, by the time I was done. So she, you know, she helped me through the whole process in that way, in a supportive, in a supportive way. And I'm in New Jersey. I'm only... I only live about 15 minutes from where Dr. Furman lived and I never went to his office and I never saw him as a doctor, but she knew who he was because I guess the physician community and she's like, I don't know. I feel like I kind of eat the same thing as he eats when I see him in a restaurant. And I was like, well, I've never seen him in a restaurant. And she did, she asked a lot of questions about what I was doing. And I said, well, you know, just read the book. I'm just doing exactly what it said. And so, boy, had that pendulum swung in the other direction, man. That's that's great. Um, yeah. And I, I suppose any other doctor that that you saw was probably equally as impressed. You yeah, know, you, I just kind of stopped seeing them. Uh, well, I mean, you know, well, if there's no longer a need, they yeah. can't take it personally, right? Right. <laughs> Final question for you here. Um, and by the way, we, we, we also still need to tell you know what, before we get to the final question, let me ask you this. You get so enthused by your own success that you kind of eventually transition over in your career into the plant-based space as well. You were one of the first to jump aboard the telehealth, um, I guess jump into the telehealth market, but you did it exclusively with plant-based doctors. Is that because of, of your own experience and your knowledge that, yeah, there's a lot to be said for nutrition as a preventative medicine and, and even treatment for a lot of people. Well, exactly right. So the whole time I went through my own transition, I was working in pharmaceutical research at Novartis and I'm here on this 500 acre campus in New Jersey where almost 10,000 people work just on this site. And I did, the thought just kept echoing in my mind, you know, 80% of what we're doing just enables people to continue living unhealthy lives. 
And what I mean by that is like medications for, for high cholesterol, medications for um, high blood pressure, medications for type two diabetes, you know, all of these things. If, if people get the pill, they think they don't have to make any change. And I had learned through my own personal experience. Well, if we, you know, if we make the big change, then we don't need the pills anymore. So I, I lost some of my passion for helping to develop new, um, new drug treatment therapies. And I wanted to help people to take better care of themselves. So I did, you know, a bunch of volunteering and, and sharing my story, but then I would consistently see the same thing over and over. I would be at a talk and there would be a physician who was presenting something on the stage and they would, you know, they would basically present their knowledge or their scientific information. Then they would show case studies. They would show someone like yourself or someone like me, and they would show maybe a before and after picture. And they would talk about how the, how they, how that doctor helped this patient to get well. And then they would go to Q&A and someone in the audience raises their hand and they say, hi, my name is so-and-so and I suffer from a similar condition. Where can I find a doctor who can help me? And there's not an easy answer to those questions. You know, it mm. depends on where you live, who you have access to, you know, what you can afford, all of these things. So that's really the problem that I set out to solve with telemedicine. You know, my background is informatics. So, so I understood the technology platforms that existed. And I said, wow, if, if there's a doctor who's licensed in multiple states, that one doctor can reach a whole bunch of people and, and uh, you know, can help them to get healthy. So I knew doctors who wanted to see more patients, you know, practice this kind of medicine. And I knew a lot of, you know, patients who wanted to see doctors who would treat them in this way. And, and plant-based telehealth is essentially a place to bring them together. How has the reception been on that? Um, I mean, being in this space and based off of what it was that you just said, uh, I know that there was a big void in that market. Uh, how has the reception been thus it, far? Yeah, it's been fantastic. And, um, you know, the first, I don't have a very small social media following, it, it, you know, a couple thousand people, you know, on Facebook and Instagram, it's not big by any means, but, um, I posted, you know, the first night that, that it went live, that we launched it. And, um, I heard from 20 people who wanted to be patients who wanted to see a doctor. And I heard from 22 doctors who wanted to come onto the platform so that they could see patients. And that was kind of the validation. I mean, that, that was, that was how warm the welcome was. And, it's since been welcomed just as warmly from coaching companies because people who are coaching patients, they have to teach them then how to not listen to some of the things that their doctors are going to ask them. Like, where do you get your protein? You know, where are you going to get your calcium if you're not drinking milk and you know, these kind of things. So, so to have a doctor who is fully aligned with someone is with what someone is doing or what a coach is, is helping a person to do for themselves. It's just been really warm warmly received. And um, it's been two and a half years now. And I'm just grateful for the thousands of patients who have been able to have um, access to a doctor who treats them with lifestyle medicine based in whole food, plant-based nutrition. And we're starting to collect the outcomes now. And it's incredible. I love that. Yeah. Now you're kind of getting those before and after stories. Um, that's awesome. That's, the, that's the rewarding part of it, isn't it? Um, yeah. I mean, just helping people yeah. to, to basically live higher quality of life. And I know, you know, what we're talking about that. That's really what it's about. It's not about Absolutely. restricting or not eating this or not eating that. It's about really, you know, getting yourself to a place where you can really enjoy life. No question about it. And what final question here, what would you say to somebody who was in your position uh, or who is in the position that you once were, and they think that they could never achieve that level of success, that health just is not in their DNA whatsoever? What would you say to that person? So I have a long list of things I would tell them, but, but, but the most important things are, yes, you can. The number one, you can do it because if I've done it and so many others that I know have done it, you can absolutely do it. Number two, it's worth it. It's worth all the effort that it takes in the world to figure out how to make it work for you. And what you have to do is you have to just put everything aside, all, the, all that doubt and solve every problem that comes your way. If you don't like to eat this, that's fine. You have to figure out how to eat something else that's just as healthy it's that way. You have to just look at every little obstacle as a problem that you need to solve because the same thing isn't going to work for me that worked for Chuck that works for someone else. Like you have to figure out how to make it work for you. And the only way you're going to do that is if you're determined to, 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 um, to figure it out. And 
the the last thing i guess is just to realize that it's really really hard like change is really hard but it's only hard for a short period of time and that's where we lose it because you talk to people who've doing this for, been doing this for a long time and and it's easy now but you have to kind of get through that hard period of change and for some people it's really hard for a month or two some people it might be really hard for a year or so but um just know that it that it gets easier it gets enjoyable it gets pleasurable like it, it gets to be normal um if you just commit to it and get yourself over that period of change oh man you hit the nail on the head man it's just like get comfortable with being uncomfortable and somehow that makes the whole situation a little bit more comfortable, maybe enough to the point where you can get past uh, all of those cravings and fighting so hard to go back to your old way of eating, go back to your old unhealthy lifestyle. But if you just accept the fact that change is hard, may not be the easiest thing for you in the moment, and there will be times when you want to kick and scream and you want to throw a temper tantrum like a terrible two-year-old. My goodness gracious, the fact of the matter is you can get past that hurdle. That too shall pass, as they say. And man, is the future bright on the other side of that, wouldn't you say? Sure is. Yeah, it's wonderful. Yeah. Come on, come join us. <laughs> the water's fine. Come on in. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Anthony Massiello, thank you so much, my friend. You are a true inspiration. It has been great talking with you today. Yeah, you're very welcome. Thanks a lot for having me on, Chuck. If your health IQ was a couple of points higher than it was a few minutes ago, go ahead and like this video or subscribe to the YouTube channel. And to take it even higher, head over to Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your favorite shows. Look for the exam room by the Physicians Committee. Hit the subscribe button there as well and help to make your world a healthier place.